Oh, for home shopping <laughs> I love home shopping <laughs> Got two of them, one for him and one for me. Okay. Well, welcome everybody to our second part of our Commissioner Day here. And uh, we're going to hear presentations from our two people that we're interested in selecting from. And uh, you are the lawn boy, right? No, no, VW Construction. Okay. I expected you to be standing up for that one. I, I didn't want to address the mic until you were ready for me, but happy to stand and start if that's what you'd like. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. You guys are all VW? Yes, we brought, brought the team. <coughs> He's a nice guy. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, just kind of way of background, I know the commissioners are familiar with me and, and my history here in the community, but for Tracy's sake, I don't know how familiar Tracy is with me. I'm born and raised here in Carroll County. Uh, my family still lives here. My wife's family still lives here. They farm out this way as well. Um, Carroll County is still home to me. I, I deeply care about this community. Um, it's, why I'm, it's why I'm here, frankly. Um, most recently, I served as Chief of Staff to Congressman Jim Baird, our Congressman. Um, and really, uh, I left the private sector to go do that because Carroll County is in that congressional district. And it was a chance to really have a positive impact on my hometown community. Uh, every meeting I took out in Washington, I tried to make a connection back here to Carroll County. I really felt as an unofficial ambassador to this community. Uh, and surprisingly, or unsurprisingly, I had a, a great chance to talk about Delphi and Flora and Burlington uh, with a lot of people from across the globe. And it's really neat to talk to them when you're passionate about where you grow up, people get that and they care about it. And so I'm here today, I'm back in the private sector. Uh, I do multi-client work and I represent BW Construction. And uh, luckily for me, I have the opportunity to pick who I work with. And BW Construction is the top of the class when it comes to jail construction projects. This is what they do. This is their specialty. I would not bring them here today unless they could do this job at an exceptional level. That's why they're here. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the presentation, who is on our team, um, and then by, by way of that, we will start the presentation. Dustin Fry. Dustin's a co-owner of BW Construction and the director of construction. Brad Batten, to my left, co-owner of BW Construction and BW Development. Jay Trowling is the director of pre-construction. And Ted Brown, the senior project manager. Um, for me, this is, this is a project I will be involved in intimately from start to finish. I'm not just bringing someone here, trying to help them and leaving. I will be intimately involved in this process through the whole step. Uh, we'll do weekly update calls, standing calls, choose to join, not to join, but communication and transparency are really important in this process. I think we've seen that from the start of all of this, the origin of it, that communication is key for all of this. Um, so I'll be a project liaison. I'll be the key project liaison through this process. We'll have a, a superintendent site manager on site for the construction of the project overseeing it all, uh, but I'll be a, a key pipeline into communication. We'll attend all commissioner meetings, council meetings, and any special joint meetings that we will have. Um, a couple of key points to note is we really want to build relationships through this process. We care about that. Uh, we'll have no added fees through this process, no developer fees. Uh, we, we're going to do this in a way that is best suited for the taxpayers of Carroll County. Again, um, that's just part of my commitment to caring about this place uh, and bringing in high quality talent. Uh, part of the reason we can do that, there's no redundancy in our model. We're not stacking other firms within our team to do that, right? You'll have construction and markup and then developers. You start putting too many people on your team, it starts adding up the cost to the taxpayers at no real value. So that's a priority for me through this process. Um, let this conversation be informal. Interject whenever you want with questions. Happy to do that and have, have conversation. Uh, just a reminder, I, I brought a bunch of builders with me, not public speakers. So uh, we're just here to have casual conversation and answer questions. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dustin. And uh, I'll be back up towards the end to hit a couple of key points. Thank you. While I'm, while I'm yeah, of course. Here, yeah. You don't have to have an actual one of these. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Did you get one? 
Oh, you don't need to. You sure? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I go for the highlights. I wanted to talk a little bit about our RFP response. Um, and we always try to keep our responses lean and as short as possible because no one likes to read them. We just stick to the relevant questions you guys ask. So we didn't put a lot of fluff in there. We tried to tailor make this to just the questions you ask. And one of the first things we noticed during the first page you guys are looking to select a bot contractor for construction services. Now typically with a bot, we have a sister development company. We usually have our development company lead and put our construction company as a sub to that. But with this, the way this was formatted, it forced us to ask that question, do we need a developer and a contractor on this job? We've done private jobs without a developer where we'll hold all the contracts and we can take care of all the transfers and everything else. And for that reason, we chose on this job just to not have a developer. Our construction company can perform all the services of a developer without that redundancy or extra fee, and that should lead to more scope for you guys and a more streamlined approach. So that's why we approached it that way with this project. And um, the other thing I want to highlight is, yeah, we have no developer fee, we have no scoping fee, which means we don't get paid a penny if we're selected until we get to financial close on this project. So if we walk out of here as partners today, you will never get an invoice from us until we get to financial close and we know we have a project to move forward is important. And lastly, from a fee approach, we don't keep contingency. We'll have a line item in the budget for contingency, but that's not ours. So any unspent contingency will return to you guys. You can use it for FF&E or other items of the course of the process. But we only make money through our construction services. I wanted to clarify that right out of the gate because I think it's a very important strength of our team and how we approach this project. And I think we're the most experienced. I mean, we've wrapped up four very large jails that have either completed or in construction in the last 18 months. Those jobs are done. Our guys are ready to roll into this one, so we have more than enough capacity and experience to take care of what you guys do. So, so those four jails that you finished up, yeah. were they over budget, under budget, or on budget? Under budget. We've never had to change order on a bot, ever. <coughs> we've never had to change order. We've never not got to financial close on a BOT, ever. And we've closed two BOTs. Um, there have not been a lot of jail BOTs in the state. We've done two of them. I believe there are three to four in the entire state, and we've done two of them. Since we've been in existence, I would say 75% of our total revenue is in jails, is what we do. Um, Dawson Fry, one of the owners of BW Construction, and uh, lead all of the, the construction process, as much of the development as well. Um, and I wanted to touch base on our relevant experience. Um, as Brad mentioned, over the last 18 months, we've either completed or have ongoing uh, four jails. The total uh, bed count of those four jails is nearly 1,800 beds and $180 million of jail construction. Um, two of those were under the BOT delivery method, Delaware County Justice Center uh, over in Muncie and Clay County out in Brazil. Brazil. Um, Delaware wrapped up just about 18 months ago, and it was what we believe would be the first BOT jail project that was delivered in the state. It was about $48 million. Um, and we, to tag on to your question, Tracy, um, that project did come in under budget. Um, the commissioners were able to add additional scope to the project that they wanted at the end. Um, Clay County is just recently broken ground, so we're in the early stages of that project. It's 285 beds, it's an addition to their existing jail, um, and that is also under the, the BOT statute. The other two relevant jails, um, go to the next slide, would be both Hendricks County and Hancock County. Hancock County um, finished up a few months ago and uh, added 440 beds with the capacity to add um, another 500 with an expansion that's, that's put the infrastructure in for to, to expand as necessary. Um, that project, I'm, I'm proud to say, even though it wasn't under the BOT delivery method, um, the only change order we had on that project was a deduct change order to return money to the county at the very end of the project. Um, Hendrix is set to wrap up um, at the end of this year. Um, and from all we can see in terms of forecasting costs, we anticipate the same option to the commissioners and to the county at the end of returning unused funds. We take pride in not going over budget. When we, when we give a county or a city or any client what we
what we would call a GMP. Um, it's, it's a true GMP, it is the guaranteed maximum price. We do a lot of due diligence on the front end of our projects to make sure that we're understanding the scope, desires, working with our um, key subcontractors and the relationships we've built up in the industry um, to, to make sure that when we sign on the dotted line that we know that you guys can you know, tell your taxpayers and go to bed at night knowing that that's not going to be a penny more. At least stay behind that. Um, in terms of kind of our presentation today, as Quincy mentioned, we're not professional presenters. If you have any questions throughout, let us know. Uh, it tends to make it easier. A couple things I just want to highlight before we, we get into the meat of, of kind of how we do things and our approach. Um, we utilize our experiences in every project. So it would be stupid of us not to reference back to what we've done, where we've learned from you know, issues that have come up. Um, so we're going to rely heavily on, on the past jails, not just jails though. But it's, Sheriff's Office, police station, fire stations, they all have components that, that tie into every project. Um, so we truly utilize our past history to, to go into every project. Where, where could we have been better? What could we have learned? Um, we feel like every day we're improving. Um, the other thing Brad touched on, um, we don't have any partners on this project. Um, we are fully capable of, of delivering a quality project on time and on budget county and didn't feel like we needed to bring on a partner that we had to take care of in some capacity. Partners aren't bad, um, but we'd rather just utilize our relationships. Uh, our relationships with subcontractors, um, you know, one of the key subcontractors that we utilize on every one of those jail projects is Poly Jail, the detention equipment contractor. Um, not saying they're the only ones that are an option, but we've used them on all four of those projects and have had a lot of success. I think they would speak highly of us and the projects we've done with them. Um, and we plugged those guys in very early on, but by not bringing one as a team from a partnership perspective, we feel we can hold them a little more accountable to deliver the scope and the price that we will ultimately need to get to. Uh, the other couple things that I want to make sure we mention, uh, we'll have a dedicated laser-focused staff on this project. Uh, we've done a lot of jails here recently. We're averaging about one a year. Um, so we have a team that's capable and is not going to be tied up on those other projects so we can bring those resources here. Um, Jay's in our pre-con, Ted um, from a project management perspective. Depending on final timing, we'll, we'll kind of dictate who we put out here as the superintendent and some other support staff. But um, what we'll do within our guaranteed maximum price is also have a guaranteed staff cost. So as we dive into the details of this project during the design, we'll give you a staff effort schedule that shows here's who's going to be on your project, here's the projected hours they're going to spend. Um, and much like the contingency, if there's any staff effort left over at the end, that would also return to the county. Um, if it for some reason takes a little longer, which projects these days seem to have taken a little longer with supply chain and other things, that's on us. So we're not here to use it as another profit bucket. We're trying to deliver this as lean as possible so that the county can get as much in their jail as they possibly can. Um, we'll also have a single fee. We talked, touched on that. We don't have other layers. There's no developer fee. We can do all of those services under the BW construction umbrella. Um, we'll touch base on some technology that we use that I think will be um, that you'll enjoy seeing of how we can interact with you through our technology on the job sites, what tool you get at the end of the project um, from that. And then as Quincy mentioned, um, communication and transparency is critical in what we do every day. Um, and we'll have the highest level of that on this project. We've strategically partnered with Quincy to be a part of this project from day one through its completion to make sure that we're understanding and meeting the needs of the area. With that, I'm gonna turn over the presentation to Jay Charing, who is our director of pre-construction, and, and let him kind of talk through your project a little bit in terms of pre-construction. Yes, I have a question. For you. Yes. Did you work with um, when you built these jails? Did you have a, like El Amadas or somebody else design them before you guys take over, or you guys design it yourself? To no, we don't do any design ourselves. Um, we uh, the 
the architect of record on those four projects was RQAW. Um, and we work hand in hand with those guys. Um, sometimes they're involved well before we're there. Um, other times we're involved before they get there and we help guide and lead and direct. Um, our relationship with architects is, is not an adversarial relationship. We, we feel we all have to sit at the same side of the table um, and work together. Uh, I'm not big in the finger point of this is the design team's fault, this is the contractor's fault. It's, this is a project we have one client in mind between us. Let's figure out how to get it done. So while we haven't worked with Elevatus on a jail project or any project for that matter, we, we do work with a lot of different architects on various projects. Yep. Jay Troring, director, director of pre-construction. And first of all, I wanted to state that uh, we're eager to get started on your project. And I want to kind of describe how we would do that, how we would get started in pre-construction specifically with your project. I'd say the first thing that we'd like to do to kick off pre-construction is really to conduct a deep dive into the scope with the Elevatus team and the key stakeholders so that we understand some key questions, you know, what, what are your main priorities uh, scope-wise, budget-wise, schedule-wise. We want to understand those and we make sure we hit those 100%. Um, what are the challenges that you face and how can we overcome them? We want to be aware of any challenges with your projects ahead of time so we can plan for them and make sure that they're not an issue. Um, we want to sit down and talk about recurring meetings and timelines with the design level goals so that that's all planned out. And once we get to a point where design is complete, it's a smooth transition to construction. So that's really the first thing we want to do. And it's our opportunity to essentially plan and organize the project on paper ahead of time. And we know that our greatest chance to influence the project and ensure it's successful when we get involved as early as possible. Um, talk a little bit about design coordination. Dustin mentioned working with Elvadis. Um, as I mentioned, we want to establish a meeting schedule with them. These meetings will always help us to understand the design intent as they're working on design. It'll help us discuss, discuss constructability issues that may arise with the design and really ultimately communicate things such as budget impacts and help us prepare for the buyout of the project moving into construction. So that's a big piece of what we do in pre-construction. The other thing that everyone's always really focused on during pre-construction is, is obviously the cost. So what we do is we produce a milestone estimate at each design publication. And we pride ourselves on the accuracy of these estimates even in the unstable marketplace that Dustin mentioned that we're in right now. Um, we have a wide network of subcontractors that we use, and we use those to give us real-time cost feedback on the marketplace as we're producing these estimates. And not only do we use those as subcontractors, but we have a vast historical data um, that, that Dustin mentioned from our, our jail experience and other projects that we blend together with those subcontractors feedback to really give you the most accurate estimates possible. Um, we feel like our estimates are not only accurate, but they're well-rounded and they're clear for you to understand what's in it and what's not in it. And if there's any issues along the way with how, how much money that we have to work with, if there's a budget issue, we're prepared to dive in with value engineering solutions at each design <coughs> milestone um, to keep costs in next thing I want to talk about is, is how we package the, the bid itself when it gets time. Um, on the screen, I know it's a little hard to read maybe, but it was in our RFP proposal, but we put together a, a plan already of how we would foresee packaging your project into different packages for subcontractors. And what this does is it essentially caters it to those subs so you get the best buying power um, and best opportunity for good pricing. Um, the other thing that goes hand in hand with the bid packages is it allows us to outline 100% of the scope. So we're working hand in hand with Elvatus during design, figuring out everything that's in the project and making sure that those bids contain 100% of the scope so there's no gaps. And what I want to say about bid packaging and going out to bid is that while we're, we're happy to use our vast network of subcontractors, we also want to be aware of any contractors that you may have used 
whether it's a good experience or a bad experience, we want to be mindful of that and be sure that we're taking care of that during the project. I think it's key to understand that if, there, if there's a local contractor, we're going to try to tailor packages to involve as much local participation as possible. <coughs> While we put some packages up here, you know, we, haven't, we haven't sat down with Delawatis, so we've not seen any design. Yeah, we'll, we'll tailor those appropriately to, to maximize the dollars to stay. subcontractors there is a local and you want us to give them an opportunity to say match low bid so that that work can stay here local so we prefer we can do that we don't have to have just a public rip it or even take low bid we can negotiate with whatever partners you guys want us to or if you've had a terrible experience we can exclude whoever you guys want us to and to that point we've already started the research of who locally would be a good opportunity to work with and now like I said hard to see but it's on that list there that was in the RP for some of the names that you might recommend Kind of wrap up pre-construction. Uh, obviously, we'll get to a point where we're establishing a guaranteed maximum price of GMP. Uh, we understand, based on the RFP, that your goal is to do that at the time where we're having 100% construction documents. Um, what you'll you'll see is that our GMP mirrors our milestone estimates very closely, so it won't be foreign to you. It'll be thorough, it'll be clear and concise, uh, and very familiar. And like Dustin said, it's a true GMP. Then we have a true GMP of staff costs. So that essentially is our, our um, that's a very important point of the project. You're establishing the, the scope of the work and you're establishing the price to do that. So uh, GMP is, is our most important part of pre construction. And uh, just to reiterate from what they've all said here this morning, communication is, is huge for me. And I want to make sure that my team in pre construction is communicating to you often and clearly so that we have everything transparent on the table, issues, budget, schedule, all that on the table. So you can make the best decisions for your project uh, with the best information possible. So um, that, that's essentially pre-construction. And unless anyone has questions, I'll turn it over to Ted. All right, uh, good afternoon, Ted Brown, uh, Senior Project Manager for BW Construction. Um, so now that it's kind of through the pre-construction side, we really get into more of the construction aspect, um, you know, bringing this design and this dream to fruition. Uh, and with that, we really enhance on our company's core philosophies um, that were kind of mentioned earlier on the slides. I know to reiterate and kind of regurgitate what everyone else has said, communication is a strong, strong goal for us. Um, and that's, you know, through and through, especially through construction. Um, we want to be as communicative as possible. Uh, we like to hold re recurring uh, bi-weekly or weekly owners contractor meetings, um, come into these, you know, these meetings here and present and you know, be there to be communicative. Uh, through that as well, we also issue out owners newsletters. Um, so this is something that we do on a weekly basis, typically Friday afternoons. We like to send these out so that it's something transparent. You know, it's something fun to send out to some people that aren't there seeing the project come up come up and come to life every day. You know, we include uh, updated photos of the project site, kind of show what's going on, uh, tag to some work completed in the last week, work coming up, uh, and then some milestone and key activities, kind of get everyone, you know, looking forward to the next thing. So this one here, you know, we, we use a topping out beam on a project for a client. Uh, we brought in a beam, or the, the last beam that was going to be placed on the project was the main beam right in front of the main entrance. But it was for an age 55 and older community. Uh, so there was a bunch of people that have already purchased homes and bought lots, everything else. So we actually uh, worked alongside one of our uh, clients, Pulte, and went out and <coughs> did a big cookout type setup uh, for all the residents that already purchased land out there. We set the beam up. All the residents got to come up, sign the beam. I mean, they, they absolutely fell in love with the construction process. But through this, there's other things we can do when you do it. Yeah, there's multiple. <laughs> So, self cleaning the walls would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a, it, it was really cool. It was, it was fun community engagement. Uh, this is a newsletter they send out to all the residents on a weekly basis. You know, keep everybody in the loop on kind of what's going on in the process. 
Um, so, you know, we're going to be communicative as possible. So, into the transparency side, you know, we, we want you to be a part of the process with us. We want you to be boots on the ground, uh, being out there, being a part of our team through the construction process. Um, so, one way that we do this is we actually utilize live stream cameras on our project, such as that Earth Cam setup. Uh, where we're actually live streaming 24 7 during the day. Um, this actually acts as a dual uh, job site security camera as well. So, at night, this actually rotates back to our main gate and watches our uh, project entrance. Uh, from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., as well as kind of kicks back to a couple key tie points throughout the night. Uh, so it's kind of a dual aspect to it. It allows that live feed, uh, which over time will ultimately create some, some cool time lapse when the project is done as well. So we can kind of bring it all back together and have a cool little marketing piece to it that you know can, can stick around for years to come. Uh, with that transparency piece as well, and I guess the communication side too, we utilize a, a project management software called Procore. Uh, we utilize this on all of our projects. Uh, it's a big piece of what we do here because it allows us to be uh, communicative on anything that's happening on the job site. So you're able to see all the daily photos. Uh, there's drawing specifications. It allows us to collaborate uh, not only with our subcontractors but with the owner as well and the end user. Uh, but it also allows us to be transparent in the fact of what's coming through, kind of through the submittal process and the RFIs, and kind of getting into more of the technical um, that ultimately gets staged in a one big database that can be used for years to come as well. So. You know, if something does arise a year or two down the future, you're like, why did we do that? I remember something. Well, we have a, we have a database that we're able to fall back to and, to and understand. So, moving into collaboration, uh, the communication and transparency are key for this next step in collaboration. And, you know, we collaborate primarily with these guys here all through the front end. You know, communication and collaboration with the owner and understanding all the expectations that need to be met. Now when it gets to the site, it's our turn to start collaborating with our site contractors. Uh, we, are, we are a field-based team. You know, we like to be out in the field. We have the presence in the field. You know, we're not one of these contractors that sits behind a desk in an office and tries to run this project from behind a computer. Now, do we have some cool fancy technology that will allow us to do that? Yeah, but we gotta be the field generals out on site. We gotta be collaborating with our contractors. And through that, we utilize all kinds of different technology. Um, so this here, for instance, is a drone map that we have created of a pre-pour uh, slab meter. So anytime before we start pouring slab on grade, we're able to actually take the drone and integrate a two-scale high-accuracy 2D map of the project site. Uh, this will allow us to actually come up and see you know, where all the rough ends are supposed to be located compared to where they're currently coming up at. So this has the floor plan over top of the actual um, slab itself, and we're able to put together digital surface models, make sure that the stone is perfect, to where the slab's actually coming in at the proper thickness, and you know, we're not getting skimped down some concrete here and there, ensuring that all of our, our all of our qualities up to specifications we're meeting, we're meeting what we told you we would meet um, through the full collaboration effort. And through that too, it allows it allows us to get ahead of any challenges that come up. Because like these guys talked about as well, is the uncertainty in the market. You know, there's there's no room for error. You know, when you get down to certain points in the project, you know, there's lead times can ultimately come into effect if something got messed up during the process. So us having these tools and this deep, different collaboration effort with all of our contractors allows us to try to mitigate all risks uh, throughout the construction process. And then tying all those into adaptability, um, we have a we have a strong suit to come up with creative solutions to all kinds of complex problems. So this is for instance we we were tasked with the exterior facade renovation of pyramids downtown Indianapolis. Uh, we were trying to figure out how we were going to, you know, propose a, you know, GMP sense to the owner on a different kind of contract scale, but provide them with a cost that would be highly accurate because they had came across one of the facades and within, you know, within the first facade they burnt up the entire budget of the exterior. Well, they came to us here for the second round of this solution and we're able to actually take our technology and leverage it and create 3D <coughs> models of the building, which um, allows us to actually click on each individual photo and identify you know, what's happening 200 feet in the air. Because once that scaffold starts dropping, I'm not going on it. <laughs> I'm not going 150 feet up and sitting up there on top of that wind trying to figure out why this is that way. Uh, we're utilizing our technology and we're adapting to all kinds of new uh, situations and circumstances that kind of allow us to get creative creative on the field aspect of this. Um, so through that type of type of model, we actually do this for facade inspections as well. So before 
you know, before the building gets enclosed with you know, masonry or however it's getting wrapped up with siding, um, we're able to actually identify and target and key in on how all the air barrier details come together. You know, all the water infiltration problems that come over the course of longevity of maintenance. You know, where, where, let's get ahead of it now. Let's, you know, high quality, high, high consistency across the board, uh, especially when it comes to our exteriors. Um, but through this, on the entire technology side and everything that we kind of put together as all of our core philosophies, it ultimately leads into a lot of our project turnover too and creating that database that you're able to have for historical records for years to come. You know, this is, you know, it could be 20 years down the road and you're wondering what's happening behind a certain window or on the side of a certain window. Rather than tearing all the facade off, you can now say, this is how it was constructed. This is probably where the issue is coming from. So we're able to identify these things now and have this backup database for years to come. Um, it allows us to, to stay ahead of the game. So, through this as well is we've taken the next leap to kind of start generating a construction schedule uh, for this process, um, utilizing some historical data like Jay had mentioned as well. We have the same thing when it comes to the field construction side. We have the historical data for past projects we've seen. And we've kind of started generating Quincy, a schedule that's based yeah. in a sequential yeah, order of how this process needs to come together. Um, this allows us to really focus on the front end and start being proactive rather than reactive to a lot of these long lead items and a lot of items that ultimately could come around at the end of a project. If it's got held up in some type of shipping delay or a material delay, there's all kinds of different supply chain issues that we're currently running across. So we're able to actually take this schedule and backtrack it uh, through the procurement phase to identify all the key highlight points uh, moving into it. So as this process moves forward, the schedule gets more redefined. Um, but as of now, it's kind of a high level, high level breakdown. Yeah, and I think it's important. I just, we just wanted to show, I mean, that the schedule we, we put in our RFP is kind of just kind of highlighting the general sequence and very generic. Um, so we thought it would be beneficial to start to plug it into our scheduling software with real activities and, and what we've seen from you know, other jails we've done in general durations. And, um, don't pay attention to the dates. We picked an arbitrary date. There's some stuff in here that doesn't line up. We're not going to pave your parking lot in January. It's just not possible. Um, so there, there's definitely some stuff there. But just to, to show you the thought, we've already started to put into this. Um, it's changed and we're ready to hit the ground running. Uh, the other thing we're going to talk about um, is you know what, what happens when we're all said and done, right? And there's, there's three phases to a project, the pre-construction, the construction and then there's the closeout. And a lot of times that just kind of gets glossed over and it's like, here's the keys, enjoy your new building, call us if something arises. Um, we want you to call us if something arises, I guarantee there will be something that comes up. There always is. They're not perfect. But um, what we like to pride ourselves in is to provide a seamless transfer. Um, in the BOT, it's, it's build operate transfer. We, we have to transfer back this project. We have to meet all the scope. Um, it's a very simple process from a transfer perspective um, that we do every day in our projects. But much like Ted had mentioned with all the technology, we're, we're delivering you more than just here's a two binders of operation and maintenance manuals and some drawings that have been redlined of what's actually built out there. But we're giving you that with tools that show, you know, five years from now, the sheriff needs to do a little renovation in, in the jail. You can go in and literally click on photos and peel back the drywall and you can see what's in the wall peel back the siding from these images that we do regularly on these job sites. And it's a tool that will be on your system forever. Right? It's invaluable because you know, 20, 25 years from now, you know, we're all in different places or not in doing it. We don't care about the jail in Carroll County, but somebody does and we need to make sure you guys have the tools and the taxpayers have the tools to, to utilize that. Um, so it's very user friendly. The other thing that we want to do is kind of maximize the warranty. So our project team, our superintendent, our project manager, myself, four times over the first year of the project, each quarter, we want to come and walk through with the users of that building and make sure that you know everything is up to snuff with what we promised. Um, are there some doors that need adjusted? Is this just not quite working right? Is the programming of the thermostat off so that we can make sure that you know the contractors owe you one year of the workmanship warranty outside of other warranties for equipment and different things? 
that you're, everything's in working order and all the bugs have worked out of it. So we do that four times over that first year. And then over the next two years, even though there may not be a warranty, we still come back once a year for years two and three and walk through and make sure these buildings are fine-tuned and right to where they need to be. And you know, a lot of times if something pops up, we'll, we'll send somebody up and just take care of it right then and there. It's not a, hey, we're gonna send you a bill. We just, we wanna make sure that it's a lasting, the facility is lasting to what it was intended to be and everybody's, everybody's happy with that. Um, so with that, one of our taglines is we're truly partners from start to finish and that's, that's why we like this delivery method. We want to be involved from the beginning. We want to see it throughout the end. Um, I think it's critical to know two of the projects, two of the jails that are done, Delaware and Hancock, we have already gotten a second contract with both counties on different projects. That it, it went well enough, they've hired us for their next project, um, non-jail related. So with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Quincy to switch on me here um, and let him close us out here. So if you get it selected, then you would give us one of these? We would give you one of those with a little more detail and, yep. A lot more coordination. Once we know some key dates and the design timeline, we'll, we'll get that tuned in so you can know exactly when you think this is going to. That'd be something we can hang up in there and check off. Yeah. Every time we walk in. It's like the fundraiser thermometer, you know, you can start right. to check off. Yeah. Yep, exactly. So, let's see. Yeah. I appreciate you all taking the time to listen and ask questions and be engaged in, in the process and, and allowing us to participate in this process. Uh, a couple of key points just to kind of summarize and follow up from what Jay and Brad and Justin and the team have said. Um, relevant and current experience with jails and BOP projects. That's us. Um, your project, the RKE focus over the next however long it takes to complete the job. Um, we've got the staff to do this, and capacity to do this, and do this the right way. Um, but I think what's really important to note is we're gonna do this in a cost-effective way for the taxpayers. No developer fees, putting contingencies in place, return that cost back to the taxpayers. We're not stacking our team deep that returns little value to the county, to the elected officials, to the taxpayers. Um, we have repeat clients every time we do this. Like, we're good at it. We're very good at it. Um, and if I, if I can just be very direct, you have two submissions, right? Only one of those teams has led bots for jail projects, and that's us. We've done two bot jails. There's a very key distinction between doing a jail construction and doing jail bot projects. It's more intricate, there's more details involved, and we've led two of those. And I, I think that matters a lot on the qualification side. Um, and we're gonna do it cost effectively. Um, relationships matter through the process. We're gonna maintain and grow these relationships. And we're gonna walk through this together and we're gonna be successful for the county. And I'm really looking forward to hopefully having an opportunity to do that with you all. Any questions? Have you done any other projects in the county? Myself? The team? No, no I, I would point out though, um, you know, okay. we've, <laughs> We've, we've helped EDC informally in some ways with Jake, just kind of connecting him with some people. Um, and we've established those relationships. Um, but this is the only, we primarily focus on trying to do jail projects. So we have not been chasing work across the rest of the county or in Delphi or anywhere else. Our competitors have done work here in the county before. So. So like you heard this morning, like you said, if we would hire you and work with repeat customer, we have plans you know, you heard us talking about an ambulance car. Yeah. We already got the plans. We can hand those to you and you can go. Manage and get it done. Absolutely. Awesome. Set up to us tomorrow. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, of course, you're always going to go through the RFP process and try to find who's best, but um, building the partnerships with a vision for the county and kind of walk arm in arm through that process, you find someone that works well, try to keep on working with them when you can. That's, I think that's important. Yeah, we're not a one and done contractor, right? I think we want to expand our relationship, grow together, help the community. Um, like we haven't, we have not done a lot of work here in Crow County. We started to work with Jake and trying to help him out, uh, DBC. But um, whatever type of project, we, we have a lot of jail experience. But fire stations, EMS, police, any type of public, we, we've done it. it. May not be under the BW name, but our team of people that, that work for us have their own resumes that they brought to the to the company as well. We just closed the DOT about a month ago next door in Cass County. 
and that job started as a renovation of a couple of buildings that Jay was leaving pre construction on. And I think Ryan and Louis were happy about being four plus buildings and more. And Back to the pre-construction uh, portion of the deck here. Uh, on milestone estimates, you mentioned value engineering solutions as a way to keep those costs in line at every iteration. Um, what is a what is a real life uh, example of a value engineering solution? So one that always comes to my mind that made a big impact on a project that I did. It may not be necessarily applicable to a jail, but it might. Um, but we did a study on a project that we did at Purdue University where this, the building was four stories tall, and the floor to floor heights were you know, 14, 15 feet. And the costs of, for the building were ended up, they were over budget, so we had to go and figure out some creative solutions. So what we ended up doing is shaving just as much as, I think, six inches per floor um, and changing around some of the utility or MEP systems to be able to accommodate that, but you're able to still maintain the ceiling heights in each of the levels, but it reduced the building height by a total of you know, about two feet. So you're saving two feet of structure, two feet of wall, two feet of um, exterior, and anything else associated with that height. So it ended up being a substantial savings, yet it really didn't impact the function of the building. Um, so that's, you know, I always go back to that's that's one of my, uh, where I want to hang my Good example of value engineering what we'd like to try to do. So these are solutions that wouldn't necessarily change the full scope of the project? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. you know, our, our goal with value engineering is not to just put something cheaper in place, right? It's still got to provide value. Sometimes it's it may cost a little bit more money to build, but it's a better mechanical system that, that needs to go in for the life of the maintenance, right? So um, there's all kinds of examples that we could, we could throw out there. but. That's what we try to bring to the table. We're not we're not playing designer on it. We have an architect. We're going to work hand in hand with, with that team to, to come up with the best solutions and options that are out there. So. Hey, a good question there, uh, Sheriff or Scott or anybody have any questions you want to put forward? Yes. Okay. Um, you talked about material price increases. And Well, I mean, the intent with this GMP, it sounds like, is to get through the design. So we're, we're bidding, uh, you know, at a time when we have 100 documents, um, lock in contracts immediately. Um, you know, over the last 12 months, the material increases have been kind of rampant, and some some suppliers won't hold their price, others will. You know, um, sometimes we'll dip into the contingency if it's just uh, if it's not possible to be push back on the subcontractor. Um, we've added language to our contracts, we added to our bidding you know, to try to get in front of that. Um, but it's just, it's unfortunately part of the times. Hopefully by the time we, we get to bid this one out, the, the, the market has slowed down in that. But uh, if anything, it's, who knows what's going to go on in the next 18 months. And kind of piggyback that too, is the delivery method we have, we have the ability to specify the schedule ahead of time and say, hey, this is when we're actually going to complete the work. So uh, you, there's no excuse for you knowing when you're going to be doing it. Uh, it's all on the table. So it should be accommodating the installation up front, or at least doing their very best to give that, that value in their bids to us. So we'll state that in, in the package. I mean, we, we do a lot of purchasing on day one, too. I mean, we write a contract, we'll buy the, the studs, the tension put whatever we need to buy to get ahead of that. Cass County that Brad mentioned just did it. Um, we had three buildings that were re-roofing. Roofing is one of the biggest issues right now. Um, we had to pay a little bit of a premium before we had all three groups done over the next three months instead of over the next 12 because we couldn't get anybody that would guarantee you know, what insula insulation price is going to be in January. And it's one of the first things that we're taking advantage of our 
advantage of on our schedule, which is the roofing aspect. So we were able to get ahead of it on the front end of the construction schedule, get it coming, get them lined up before winter hit, before everything else, before any more issues arose. They had it on hand, get it done. And then one other on uh, you have, have you done multiple deliveries as far as when the transfers occurs, whether it's immediate or whether it's 20 years? Oh, we've got one Every BOT I've been a part of, we 